it's the parasite that is responsible for malaria. And in order to diagnose malaria, still the gold standard is that you do microscopy of a blood film and you look directly for these parasites in the blood cells. Um, but what do I really mean by a microscope for everyone? Do I mean everyone is going to go out and buy a microscope? Do I mean everyone is going to make a microscope? Um, and then what about what about repairing a microscope? So regardless of how you got hold of it, wouldn't it be nice if you could fix it and customize it yourself? Um, and then I think important questions to bear in mind when you're thinking about a project that's meant to be accessible um, are how well does it work? And how can we keep it calibrated? Indeed, how can we get it calibrated in the first place? And can we really use it for diagnosis? And I think this is a, a tricky question that unfortunately I've only really got time to mention today, but it's something uh, in the Open Flexure project that we spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and it's a long, slow road. Um, but even more basic than why I think everyone needs a microscope, let's think for a moment about what a microscope is. Um, so here's a picture of a lab microscope that you might find in a, a typical research lab. Um, it's quite a big beast. It's quite an expensive item. Um, this is probably 20,000 pounds plus of microscope, and that's before you've added the automated stage. Um, so what's it made of? Well, the optics are the obvious thing. If I'm talking about an optical microscope, by and large, you'd be forgiven for assuming that it's mostly an optical device. Uh, but by weight, an optical microscope is about 99% mechanics. Um, even by cost, actually, the optics are a smaller proportion of the costs uh, than you might think. And a huge amount of the engineering effort of building a microscope goes into moving your sample around um, in the plane and also moving it up and down so that it gets into focus. And then perhaps most stringently of all, keeping everything in place once you've got it to the right place so that you can observe your sample without it drifting out of focus and, and producing useless images. So why is that difficult to engineer? Well, normally when you make a translation stage, what you want to do is move something in a straight line. So it's got to move nice and smoothly along that straight line. You don't want it to wobble left and right or up and down. Um, so generally what you do is you make two parts and you make them out of metal. You have a, a track of some sort and a slider. And the slider has to fit very tightly over the track so that it doesn't wobble sideways but also not so tightly that it bites. And that means that you need very precise tolerances on your parts. You need very smooth surfaces so that they slide nicely. Um, and you need very hard surfaces so that it doesn't wear down over time and get, get sloppy. Um, now, this is all relatively expensive to engineer out of metal. Um, as a species, we're very good at engineering things out of metal. Um, but fundamentally, it doesn't scale to mass production as well as you might like. Um, so could we just 3D print this? Well, yes, but actually, if you just 3D print this design, you won't have a very good translation stage. It'll be sticky, it'll wear quickly, the tolerances are too loose. Um, so instead, what we do for the open flexure microscope, the clues in the name, we use flexures. Um, so we come up with a structure that has um, thin parts in the plastic and we exploit the fact that the plastic is quite soft and flexible so that we can move it up and down by, by bending it. One nice feature of that is that it means that our little plastic microscope can be a lot smaller. Um, it's probably less than half the size uh, in one dimension. So it's yeah maybe 10 times smaller if you're thinking about volume, even smaller if you're thinking about weight. Um, and an interesting point is that the, the one of the reasons that conventional microscopes are big and heavy and made of invar is that um, we want them to be very stable and very stiff. But there are two ways to be stiff and stable. The first way is to be absolutely gigantic and made out of really hard, really thermally invariant materials. And the other way is just by being really small, because actually by having all of the components tightly mechanically coupled together, um, there's not a lot of room for things to wobble around. So what does the open flexure microscope look like? Well, it's got most of the parts that you'd expect to find in 
a typical uh, microscope in a lab. Um, I'm just going to turn my laser pointer on. So we've got a little condenser up at the top with a, an LED illumination source. Um, we have a condenser lens, a microscope objective, um, a tube lens in the middle. We've got a precision translation stage that lets us move in X, Y, and Z. Um, and then we've got a Raspberry Pi and a camera and the motor board at the bottom so that everything can be automated. So it's a fully motorized inverted microscope and it's all self-contained. So all of the electronics and so on sit inside the box. Um, and it's really starting to look more like a product than a, uh, a heap of 3D printed prototype parts. Um, it's taken us a long time to get there. Uh, there are lots of options for adding features to it. Um, but I thought I'd just highlight a couple of sort of side projects that have shot out of this. Um, ooh, uh, no, I'm going to highlight some things first. Um, so it's been designed very much for local manufacturing and maintenance. Um, we've tried as much as possible to 3D print everything and to make the, the remaining mechanical bits that you need as simple to source as we can. Um, so the bill of materials for this is remarkably small. We're keen on using it for medical diagnostics, which uh, I will mention later, um, has a lot of implications for the re reliability and the quality of documentation that we're aiming at. Um, and it's also very hackable and open, which I think will come through uh, in the rest of the talk. But yeah, a couple of side projects that have come out of this. Um, Git building is a system that we use for building our assembly instructions. Uh, and one constant bugbear of any open hardware project that you uh, look at is your bill of materials goes out of date almost instantly. Um, as soon as you change anything, your bill of materials is wrong. And then also your instructions are probably wrong. So Git building um, is our system for building these instructions from nice human readable markdown files and automatically extracting metadata so we can count all of the screws that you need. Uh, because you wouldn't believe how much time is wasted in an open hardware project counting screws. Um, and then more generally, uh, this has sort of evolved into a system of using the software version management tools like GitLab um, to manage a hardware project. And that includes everything from automatically generating our STL files in the cloud through to linking these up with interactive instructions so you can pick the right STL files and then get the right instructions to follow through. Um, and there's a preprint of that that just went up yesterday. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is lab things, and I, I hope Benedict will touch on this in his talk. Um, the microscope is controlled with software that exposes a web server. Um, and so you can control it using uh, standard HTTP requests over a network. And this has a lot of really nice properties when it comes to trying to link projects together. Uh, and if anyone's developing a new instrument and is, is curious about how to make it easy to control from five different languages, possibly all at the same time, um, I'd recommend having a look at this approach. It wouldn't be a talk about a microscope if I didn't show you some images. Um, but actually, the imaging capabilities of the open reflection microscope are, are in many ways the least interesting part because it's it's just a standard microscope. It's got a regular microscope objective. Um, so we can do bright field imaging. We can stick in a beam splitter and do fluorescence imaging. So this is an epifluorescence image. Um, and we can swap in filter cubes to do a couple of different channels. We can add polarizers to it. Um, that's some nice pictures of some liquid crystal droplets. Uh, and we can even set it up in reflection to do imaging with graphene, uh, which we had lots of fun doing with a master's project a couple of years ago. Uh, the tricky part of that one is calibrating it right. Um, this slide here, ooh, I need to click it to, to get it going. Um, this slide is showing a big tiled image. Um, so that's something that you, you quite often want to do. Um, when you're imaging a large fixed sample. Um, and it's definitely very important to us when we're looking at malaria diagnostics with um, blood smears. But uh, this slide tries to, to get across in about 30 seconds quite a lot of work. Um, scanning and tiling is something you've been able to do in microscopes for absolutely ages. But what uh, Joe Knapper, one of our PhD students, has done recently 
is um, really improve the code that moves the microscope around so that it's analyzing the images in real time. And that means if you get a Duff Z stack and it's, it's slightly skewed or it's out of focus, it will realize this and it will go back and correct it. Um, and I think this is a really important point, largely necessitated by using the low cost hardware, but actually, if you've got this closed loop control going on and the microscope can correct its errors, it opens a lot of doors. Um, and it's also very much the, the level of performance you need for, for medical devices. Um, following on from that, here's just a, a demonstration that we can do click to move. Um, and uh, if you have a look at the graph on the right hand side here, this is just me doing a, a scan. So you're, you're acquiring a mosaic of images. Um, and by analyzing the images on the fly, you can end up with much more accurate positioning of all of the images. And so you can see that the corrected images sit on a nice regular grid. Whereas if I just done it open loop, they would all be a bit wonky. Um, it doesn't completely remove the need to align them afterwards, but it means you can be much more confident that your data is good even before the experiment's finished. Um, and lastly, I thought I would just show the, the autofocus routine. This is something of a party piece for the open flexure microscope, but this is not speeded up. So this is real time software autofocus. Uh, and it's really, it's very fast and it's very reliable. So we put a lot of work into optimizing that um, because that's one of the kind of foundational building blocks that you really need to, to get everything working nicely. Um, at this point, I'm going to introduce the Open Flexure team. That's not, I'm afraid, because I'm completely finished. Uh, but um, just to highlight, there's quite a lot of people who have contributed now. Uh, so there's my research group at the University of Bath. Um, and I'll particularly pick out Joe Knapper, whose slides I have liberally lifted from for this presentation. Um, and also Joel Collins, who did a lot of the pretty renderings here. Um, Bongo Tech and Research Labs. Um, are our Tanzanian engineering collaborators. Uh, so they've done a lot of manufacturing microscopes. Ithakara Health Institute are the clinical uh, side of things in Tanzania. And we also have a, a fairly significant uh, presence in Cambridge. And so a number of people in Ketra Chikuta's lab are uh, part of the core development here. Uh, and we have here a very silly synthetic photo of the team. Um, due to our very international nature, we've never all been in the same place at the same time. Um, but uh, we've interacted a lot in many different digital ways. So having mentioned the, the what I think of as the core development team, um, it's worth saying that actually the Open Flexure community is much bigger than that. Um, so here we have uh, a few examples of um, different people using the microscope. So we've got Joram, who's our uh, technician in Tanzania, um, scanning lots of blood smear images. Uh, this is uh, Hannah, who's a PhD student from Cambridge that uh, took a microscope onto the ice in Antarctica, which is pretty cool. Um, Julian, one of our postdocs, who's done a lot of development work on the microscope, using it in the jungle in Panama. Um, and then a print farm in Nairobi, uh, churning out microscopes for use in local schools, and a great big box of microscope bodies that were part of our sort of reliability study that, that Stick Lab did. Um, and here's a map that Joe put together of all the countries where we think people have used or created open flexion microscopes. I'm pretty confident this is woefully out of date um, and we can definitely add some more countries. Uh, one of the things I keep meaning to do is, uh, is have a big survey to get people to put their pins on the map so we have a better idea of how many microscopes there are in the wild. Um, our best estimate is there's probably hundreds. But because it's an open project and you can download it without me knowing, um, actually, we have no way of knowing how many microscopes there are. I should definitely plug that everything is available on GitLab. Um, Openflexure.org is probably the friendliest place to get hold of the, the project, but um, absolutely everything can be, can be hacked about with and ex uh, explored. Uh, so please do. It's designed to be extended. Um, and in fact, this is a demo of one of the fun things you can do to extend it. Um, so this is us capturing an image in the microscope control software and then loading it up in image J. Uh, 
again, embedded within the Microsoft control software. So this is all enabled by Imjoy, which is a fantastic plugin architecture for connecting up different uh, web apps for image analysis and microscopy. Um, and I, I hope Benedict might mention it in a bit. Um, and this slide, I think I could, I could talk for a whole hour on the challenges of uh, producing good documentation for reproducible hardware. It's, it's really tough. Um, and there are not a lot of really good tools for doing it. Um, we've tried to contribute some tools for making the documentation more manageable. Um, but even so, it's still a constant struggle to get the documentation good enough that the project is really reproducible. Um, and uh, I should also mention that it's not just the microscope we make. There's also, uh, well, there's another version of the microscope which moves the sample in X, Y, and Z and keeps the optics static, which is very much intended for the optics to be ripped out and replaced with something much more complicated and exciting. Um, and we've also built a, a very high precision translation stage for fiber alignment or potentially um, micro injection, though I don't think anyone's done that yet. Uh, if you're interested in making a, a micro manipulator that's good enough for some micro injection, we'd love you to uh, give the block stage a whirl. Um, with that, I will finish. Um, check out openflexure.org, have a look at our GitLab, um, build one, play with one, and uh, give me lots of questions, or possibly send some questions after Benedict's talk. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, that is my last slide. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Richard. Uh, yeah, that's great. We will um, go on to the second talk and then we'll do questions at the end. Um, but if uh, you have a burning question that you're thinking of right now, uh, just pop it in the Q&A and uh, we'll get around to those at the end. Perfect. So our next speaker is Benedict and uh, he's a researcher at the University of Jena where he leads the UC2 project, uh, an initiative to democratize optics and microscopy which has successfully demonstrated that cutting edge microscopy can be realized for a fraction of the cost of commercial devices using open source hardened software. Uh, Benedict, go ahead. Very nice. Okay, so I just want, uh, what I wanted to say is uh, I'm second, so I was able to adapt some of the slides, um, which are now not quite finished, but I think I'll just skip all the theory part because I'm also obviously talking about microscopy, open microscopy, and um, I think, um, I have a very good role model uh, with Richard being uh, the one who basically, well, invented the open microscopy, at least for me. And um, yeah, so we basically contribute or try to contribute in the same way. And uh, just short background. So where are we? Uh, we are in the center of Germany, Jena, the city of light, and also the city of microscopy, of course. And um, so, of course, then the question would be, so what is history of microscopy and how will it proceed? So how would it look like in, this, in the future? So um, Zeiss is, for example, one of the, the um, companies around us, and all of them basically try to, to observe the small things in life, of course. And um, one thing I think which came, became very apparent is um, imaging viruses. And so um, these are all electron microscopy images. And so um, the, the material you need uh, in order to, for example, capture the, vi uh, the coronavirus or the HIV virus, um, they are really, really expensive. And so you don't have that um, that in uh, in the shelf, and especially uh, if you well if you have a light microscope, which eventually also may allow you to image live cell image. Um, um, this is very expensive and typically um, black box. So quick survey: if you use Twitter or Google or whatever, uh, this is some microscope which does something. And uh, even to me, uh, I'm in optics for ten years now. I don't know what this lens is for. So it's really a black box. And so this is a crucial part because this definitely creates a gap between those who use it and those who develops it. And I think this is um, well a problem when it comes to interdisciplinary research, and especially now uh, with the corona pandemic, that was the case that many different fields have to play uh, in, um, to get new results, for example, come up with vaccines. And so closing this thing, well, of course, is already uh, grasped it. It's a microscope who can basically uh, bridge the, um, the different uh, disciplines. And so what I'm trying to um, explain to you now is basically how to go from uh, this exponential relationship between resolution and price to something which is less steep, let's say. And um, so I don't 
think I need to go too much into the details, but microscopy, um, they just magnify stuff. And there is a limit. And the limit here, uh, basically the stone is um, situated here in Jena, dictates that the resolution is roughly half of the wavelengths you use for imaging. And um, there are some techniques which can circumvent that. And I'll explain the first one uh, now, single molecular, single molecular localization microscopy. And um, well, same slide as Richard has. Uh, problem is, of course, everything is expensive. Uh, expensive lenses, expensive control units, everything is pretty costly. But the most expensive part most often is the camera. So this easily can be more expensive than a car. And so we thought, let's start with this to make this one actually cheap. And so if you observe um, microscopy cameras and compare them with your cell phone cameras, uh, that's why I call it the power in your pocket, you can easily uh, see that they are really, really sens um, sensitive. So, and the price difference lays in few orders of magnitude. So it's 20,000 versus 20 euro for this monochrome camera from a Huawei P9, so it's already quite old. And the, the cool thing here with the monochrome cameras is that they capture, well, in monochrome light um, scenarios, four times more photons, which significantly improves your signal to noise. So you can um, have be better data processing in the end, for example. And so then you'd want to do, of course, some fluorescent imaging. In our case, uh, fluorescence is this thing when you use a laser and some fluorophores, you can uh, convert one color into another one. And well, uh, if you mix the chemistry correct, um, so this is fluorescence, so you excite um, an electron and then eventually it emits another photon with a shifted wavelength. Um, and then if you increase the wavelength, uh, sorry, the, the power of your in, um, or the intensity of your uh, light, you, you will see an effect. So um, bright field microscopy gives you limited resolution, as I said, lambda by um, half roughly. And so uh, this is basically then determined by the convolution of your point spread function of your structure. And so if you increase the intensity of your excitation and also um, have special fluorophores, you can um, bring each of the fluorophores um, to a blinking stage. So you um, quench it and then it's uh, turning into a dark state, which is non-fluorescent, and then eventually and um, not immediately, after some time, it will emit a photon. And so you will basically bring your sample to blink. And the cool thing is now that you, for each fluorophore, you can over time uh, localize the center position of your fluorophore. And this uh, gives you then a uh, very uh, much improved resolution. Um, this technique is called STORM or PALM or D-STORM. There are many different ways um, of performing this way of uh, pointillistic imaging. But finally, you can really create a resolution in the range of some uh, two nanometers. Um, and so what we try to do is basically just swapping the camera with the cell phone. And here is Brightfield, and this is the, the cell phone storm image, still on a um, bulky microscope with, in the end, 18 nanometer of resolution. And so we thought, well, this, that can definitely not be enough. So we want to basically fuse all this here into a little microscope. This is then called cell storm, and it makes use of um, uh, frugal components. For example, these optical pickup units, which allow you nanometer precision adjustment in X and Y to, for example, couple light into a waveguide. And so we use these waveguides coming from a collaborator in Norway, and they work basically like a fiber. And so you couple light into this slab here, where, for example, fluorescently labeled cells are sitting on top, and then you excite the, the fluorophores and then observe from above. So, and this gives you, um, well, this basically um, um, uncouples the illumination part from the detection and you can really make these devices really, really small. And so we also got rid of the whole bulky microscope and replaced it with a small uh, cell phone based microscope where you have this um, laser coupling into this single mode waveguide and observe it from the top. And here you see, for example, the coupling effect of your waveguide. And so with this, you can then, for example, observe um, E. coli bacteria and um, do all kinds of funny super resolution imaging. For example, here you use this um, kind of random illumination where you shake the input lens and can, uh, in the end, really um, recover resolution in the range of 100 nanometer for living samples. So it's just funny analogy since they are from Norway. But physical, physically effect is, of course, a little bit different. Um, and so what you can get then in the end, after you excite your um, fluorescently labeled sample, 
is um, first the bright field, of course, as the sum of your temporal images. And using sophisticated uh, image processing algorithms like this SURF or SOFI or our neural network based um, stuff can really go down to the um, 100 to 150 nanometers for these E. coli. And um, well, I think these I will just skip because uh, I have way more to tell uh, afterwards. So I, I once um, said that we wanted to use it for virus imaging. And of course, if, as everybody uh, may know that there was a, a pandemic or still pandemic going on and um, it causes millions of deaths and we wanted to contribute you know, in some way and um, thought that it would be interesting to, to really detect the, the SARS coronavirus with a handheld device. And so what you see here on the left hand side is this blinking um, nature of the uh, the fluor force attached to uh, a SARS coronavirus. And then if you do that over a scope of 10 minutes, for example, you can really um, detect individual fluor force. And surprisingly, um, these smartphone cameras are so sensitive that you can really um, get resolution in the range between 50 to 100 nanometers. So this is in the bright field uh, response of uh, one virus. And here on the right hand side, you can really see um, the different uh, individual fluor force, which may lead to, um, uh, high, well, to high specificity due to the antibodies we use there. So, and now I uh, kind of do a quick break um, or like, uh, yeah. So the, the other project, what uh, we are also doing is this UC2 uh, project. And may, maybe a few of you already have heard of it. Um, and usually I try to motivate it uh, like this year. So when I did my apprenticeship as an electrician um, about 10 years ago, um, it was really complicated to design a complicated electronic circuit. So you had to develop it, design the PCB, manufacture it, program it. This often took three to four weeks. And then there was this thing called Arduino. And you really just plug it into your USB. You have tons of libraries you can just use um, off the shelf. And for example, uh, like the blinking LED example gets started in just two minutes. And so we saw that there must be something similar for optics. And so if you observe optical microscopes, as Richard nicely told, um, the basic setup is always the same. So if light sources, lenses, objects, uh, objectives, and lenses, and also a camera. And so um, the, the way they interact with, with each other is um, Fourier optics. So you see that the, the different focal lenses interact with each other by basically just concatenating um, one another. And so it's inherently uh, useful for modularization. And so if you have these blocks um, in our uh, approach, it was really just um, a cube. You can then stack them to form arbitrarily complicated microscopes. And so that was the first one where we wanted to use it in a high safety biolab to observe macrophages while differentiating from monocytes. And so we had a few of those um, running in parallel for a few weeks um, just for imaging how they may behave uh, on different drug concentrations, for example. And so it's fully 3D printed. And then once you insert your uh, sample and eventually um, have to get rid of the whole setup, you could eventually um, also uh, throw it away, which we have never done so far, but you could. And so you can also add more complicated um, um, modules, for example, lasers or XY stages to, for example, also do a little bit more fancy uh, imaging, uh, like we did here with some SARS Corona um, uh, imaging uh, with a collaborator in, in Berlin, or even uh, more complicated with uh, structured, illumination, uh, structured illumination microscopy, where you use a two beam interference to form a structured pattern in the uh, in the sample plane, and then also reconstruct uh, the the acquired results with uh, image processing algorithms. Same with the image scanning microscopy, and these ones I just uh, well mentioned briefly. If you have uh, well, if you're interested, you can also read that. We have um, a preprint on Barakav from Haran, and the result is then better optical sectioning and also higher resolution. So that um, I think is the slide I wanted to see. So you see these stripes moving across your sample. And from this information, you can uh, really improve the resolution uh, laterally and also axially. And the whole setup is quite cheap. So we always try to minimize price and also the uh, complexity to actually um, to build it. And so you, um, with this year, you could eventually also do live cell imaging uh, in the range of 100 to 150 nanometers for a price around 
let's say two to three thousand euro and um so we also use these tools for education for example here we have these uh, light sheet microscopes and um, many times also um, teachers and professors uh, were asking us whether there's a box which unifies all these different approaches so that they can take it off the shelf and bring, uh, give it to the students and um, just perform uh, courses for example and um, based on that we decided to well follow this idea um, and fuse all these different approaches into boxes so if you have a look on our web page um, it's uh, also everything you see here on github you see different assemblies or uh, co collections for different purposes for example for elementary schools for universities or for co core facilities and um, of course 3D printing um, definitely finds its limit when you want to produce, for example, uh, a thousand of these cubes for giving a workshop or sending that to schools. And so that led us to um, producing all our cubes now in injection molding facilities. And um, with this, we are now basically able to ship, um, well, plenty of these boxes to schools around our region to uh, improve the STEM education which, um, well, not only is fun, but also makes uh, it much more um, scalable um, because it's also much more stable, let's say. And um, yeah, so I think the topic what uh, Richard now mentioned in his talk, like the smart bit, I'll just try to dive into this right now. Um, so if you, if you observe the different standards around us, there are plenty already. So most of you may know this, Lego bricks, uh, it's actually quite old patent and um, they are inner, um, also modular. So you have these large blocks, the duplo blocks and the small ones and they nicely interact with, uh, with each other. And then you have a competing system, it's called Fischer Technik. Uh, it's, I think it's known from the Germans maybe. Um, it's also very technically. And when I was a child, I, I always thought oh, that would be so cool to, to merge the two worlds. But well, since it's a closed standard, you're not allowed to use it, of course. Um, there are now some people hacking small 3D printed um, blocks to make that somewhat compatible, but since it's all patented, it's not really uh, likely that this will be adapted officially. So what we did with our standard is basically trying to form an open standard so that everybody can participate and enter their ideas. So and um, since it's all is modular, you can really take stuff from the shelf and arrange it the way that you have finally uh, or howsoever complicated optical system. And um, I would like to demonstrate that uh, in a series of a few modules, for example, a beam expander module, or maybe a lens holder or a mirror holder, or um, well, driven by the community. I just found that um, today again, somebody created uh, an adapter to merge the open flexure to the open UC2 system so that you have a, the benefit from this awesome stage an XYZ and maybe also some fluorescent readout or uh, excitation. And um, we have also more because uh, Richard mentioned this uh, block stage. Um, so a few people we actually met in this open plan forum two years ago, they, um, they're still working on this project to make a micro, uh, micro manipulator. So um, I think um, Nico is now moving to uh, the Netherlands and Jan is from Göttingen they're still actively contributing to the system to really get the benefits from open source hardware. And um, so a recent thing we also did uh, together with Richard and Wei and uh, many, many other people is basically uh, yeah, merging even more of these open source hardware projects and also open source software. And so the idea was to create a fully uh, reproducible and also smart way of um, creating biological experiments. So many often you have a protocol which can be used not only once, not only twice, but maybe a thousand times where you want to have a dilution series and then it becomes very tedious to, to do that by hand. And so therefore there are pipetting robots and um, well, they're doing a good job of course, but sometimes you also need a microscopic imaging readout. And so we integrated that into a pipetting robot, the OpenTrans. And of course, you need some image processing to finally also um, yeah, analyze the data. So therefore we use uh, Enjoy and eventually also some code to, uh, to, to predict or at least to, to analyze the data to 
give an idea of what happened. And so from there, you could eventually also then say, okay, the next iteration of my experiment should be somewhat altered. And the result is a small uh, microscope controlled by the beautiful OpenFlexure GUI or server. Uh, and uh, it's fully open source and makes um, use of so many different open source projects. Um, and the cool thing is, of, of course, if you think of um, many people having the same setup, uh, you could just um, write a protocol, for example, using this uh, a Jupyter based uh, Python control, um, export it, send it to one of your collaborators and compare the results or slightly change it and then compare them again. And uh, the, the cool thing, of course, even more is that you could also just export it and um, publish it alongside your manuscript and also have uh, a reproducibility on a very large scale immediately. And um, what's so cool about open source, it's what Richard just mentioned is, um, so what we did is basically just uh, forking the open flexure server and wrote some custom GBL uh, or Garble um, device adapters to make our um, tools directly working with the software to directly merge it into the, uh, to the workflow basically. And I think from there, there's so much cool stuff um, to be done and also uh, doable. So here you see uh, the open trans in action. This little microscope is uh, right here doing some, some scans after seeding the yeast and also um, treating them with different concentration of sugar and uh, peptone to see the growth rate. And that's basically what you see here, uh, a super frugal high throughput imaging experiment, um, which well has a, um, a, a protocol which can be used by others immediately. And so with this, I would like to well, almost finish. So we started with a, a curve which looks like this here, so very steep. And we were able to, um, well, at least, uh, uh, well, damp the, the relationship between the resolution and price a little bit. And um, I think what we learned during this whole Open UC2 project over time is really um, that you have to create tools which ensure reproducible science. And um, this, I think, is, um, well, termed open science and the tools you, you need for this are open source um well definitely scientific communication so that others know what you're doing and how you should be doing that um you also should make it accessible through open data and also um well don't hide your information so um give people access to to your uh, manuscripts or to your data uh, even though it's yeah not required by your institution so and with this I would like to thank you and say, well, I hope that you see too. And um, well, there's definitely more to be done. And quite interestingly, uh, I think, um, well, 10, not 10 years ago, but I think six years ago when I did my bachelor thesis, I used tools which are open uh, from Richard, the red tweezers. Um, it's a holographical optical tweezers. And I think there's something missing like an OC tweezers. So if there's anybody keen on producing an open source tweezers based on this framework, I would be happy to chat <laughs> and then yeah of course it's not all my work i'm just uh one part of it so it's uh the group from professor heinzmann i'm not a doctor yet um but i have been working on that and uh yeah special thanks goes to haran barbara and Rene. and uh yeah i hope you're not overwhelmed by by the many slides i showed you <laughs> thank you Fantastic. Thank you, Benedict. It's really nice to see um, some of the kind of different open source tools coming together um, like that. That's um, really great steps forward. Um, so I think we have a few questions in the chat and I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dr. Shona Bakshi, who runs the Smart Microscopy Lab uh, here at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and he is going to field some of your questions and, and start the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And thanks so much, Benedict and Richard, for fantastic uh, talks and great uh, stuff that you're doing right now. So maybe I'll start with the questions that are right now on the, um, uh, the Q&A session. So Adrian has uh, five questions uh, for um, Richard. So I'll start with those. The first question is, can the open flexure scope be used for inverted microscopy for uh, attached mammalian cells? Uh, yes, in fact, currently the only supported version of the open flexure microscope is inverted. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the major limitation, I guess, is the load capacity of the stage. 
Um, so if you have a really big, heavy sample holder, that's that's tricky. Um, mm. There is there are a couple of alternative designs that might help with that a bit, but mm. yeah. If you're looking at some attached mammalian cells on a surface, that's exactly what it's good for. And uh, when you do, sort of maybe I'll do a follow up myself on that. Um, uh, when you do inverted microscopes, uh, microscopy experiments, are you limited anyway to the objective types, for example, uh, oil objectives or air objectives? And what are the sort of travel distance for your stage and precision? Sure. Um, so in terms of objective, we've mostly designed around a 45 millimeter parfocal RMS threaded objective, but we've successfully used air and water, uh, sorry, oil and air immersion. Um, the only annoyance is that if you're working with oil immersion in inverted geometry, you have to be a bit more careful on cleaning um, mm-hmm. yeah. because otherwise the oil tends to dribble down. Um, yeah. On the other hand, because we have quite a nice enclosed optics pathway, mm-hmm. um, actually there are far fewer places for the oil to dribble into and cause problems. Yes. Yeah. Um, and in terms of travel of the stage, nominally it should be 12 by 12 by 4 millimeters. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the, the second question relates to the stage. Uh, so Adrian asks, uh, there are there seems to be two types of stages. Which one shall we pick? Uh, I'm not. You mean for the that. for the open flexure project? Yes. Yes. Um, so definitely the the one that's been road tested the most is the what I call the regular microscope. Um, so that that moves the sample in 2D and then mm-hmm. it moves the objective in Z. Okay. Uh, so there have been loads and loads of these printed. It's a really well tested design. Um, mm-hmm. But one annoying feature is that you have to move the optics up and down. Um, so the Delta stage is a newer design, which moves the sample in all three directions and the, the objective stays fixed. Um, in principle, they both have very similar performance and they have pretty much the same optics options. Um, in practice, the Delta stage hasn't been reproduced quite so many times, so we don't know it quite so well. Um, I mean, I say hasn't been reproduced quite so many times. There are still tens of people that I've never spoken to that have built one. Um, which is by many standards, actually quite a lot of reproduction. Um, But uh, yeah, if you want to build something where you've got complicated static optics, the Delta stage is probably better because then your objective is no longer a moving target. Okay. Do you have anywhere like performance benchmark of the stages in terms of their precision and registry errors? Uh, Yes. So the very first paper we published way back in 2015 Um, was essentially a mechanical characterization of the version five of the open flexure microscope. It's evolved quite a lot since then. Um, But essentially what we um, what we concluded was that the stage is pretty repeatable once you add in some software backlash compensation. So you're always approaching from the same direction. Um, Mm -hmm. The repeatability was a couple of microns on Mm -hmm. short moves. Um, If you're doing very long moves, uh, if you run into areas of the travel where it gets sticky and you lose steps, that mm. can get worse. But by and large, they're remarkably good. Okay. Um, you can get very small step sizes. So at the moment, the step size is about 70 nanometers in X and Y and about 50 in Z. Okay. Um, okay. So, I mean, the CMC stages will be more repeatable on big length scales, but the, the main advantages are um, load capacity and speed. So a a CNC stage will move a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And that's largely down to the fact that we've chosen quite small, low power steppers so that um, in the future, if we want to run a microscope in a clinic somewhere in Africa where the power has a tendency to fall over, um, Mm -hmm. you can plug it into a USB power bank and Mm -hmm. get half a day of battery life. Mm -hmm. So instead of needing a generator or a UPS, Mm -hmm. you can just have the same power bank you'd use for a phone and um, be a bit more resistant to power outages. Since, since you had like image processing pipeline close feedback back into this, is it possible to integrate like a drift correction mode where even though your stage is inaccurate, you can move the stage back by comparing images? Yeah, so we, we haven't published that, I think, but we did have a summer student who was was doing closed loop moves. Okay. Um, and he, I think he was getting a repeatability of something like 200 nanometers. Um, okay. So you can move away and come back and then correct yourself. And yeah, and yeah that's good to about 200 nanometers. 
and um, closed loop motion is built into a, a plugin in the microscope software. Um, okay. It's not used an awful lot. In fact, the only thing we use it for is calibrating the click to move function. Um, yes. But yeah, the code is there to do closed loop. Okay, and then there are two practical questions. So the, the next questions for Richard are uh, about what is the cost? And apparently there seems to be a lot of info on the price for printing, but quite little on the optics. Uh, so this uh, Adrian wants to know where they can be sourced and some cheap suppliers if you um, if you haven't uh, like Aliexpress were not considered. Um, um, so AliExpress is where we usually use. The, okay. the difficulty with AliExpress is it's quite hard to find a stable link to okay. any given product. Um, so uh, staying on top of documenting how to source things is a constant challenge. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, usually I would buy the objectives and sometimes the tube lens from AliExpress. Although the tube lens you can also get from Thor Labs, it's just more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, getting hold of a, a 45 millimeter parfocal RMS con finite conjugates objective. Um, there are lots of places that will sell them. AliExpress is definitely cheapest, but um, there are plenty of suppliers elsewhere if AliExpress is slow or otherwise problematic. Um, but if you want to build one uh, as cheaply as possible, probably what I'd do is I'd start using the very basic optics module where you just use the webcam lens on the Raspberry Pi microscope, uh, sorry, Raspberry Pi camera. Um, so then you don't need to source any other optics. Um, and I mean, it gets, it gets maybe between one and two micron resolution. Uh, so it's not bad. Um, and that's where I'd start. We've also, we've got a very active thread on the forum about how to source your optics. Um, because I think that's something that's very hard for me to maintain because I know where I buy it from and, and that works for me, but not everybody can buy there. Um, and so there are lots of people who've shared different suppliers. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, maybe has a, has a question. Yeah, Richard, I was just going to ask if you could share a link to the forum um, in the chat so that people know where that is. Mm. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. I hope that's correct. And I'm just going to click it and make sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and the next question is about the material for your open picture microscope. Uh, so the question is, is PLA fine? for printing or ABS is needed? PLA is fine. Uh, okay. I basically yeah. never use anything other than PLA. Um, okay. one, one of the guiding principles of this was that I really wanted it to be printable anywhere. And okay. as soon as you start requiring exotic materials and even ABS counts as exotic because a lot of people can't print it, um, mm. you lose a lot of utility. Uh, I mean, our, our thinking was very much that the open flexion microscope ends, aims to be not only repeatable enough that you can duplicate my experiment exactly, but accessible enough that you can duplicate my experiment exactly on a whim, mm. which then means that you get orders of magnitude more people doing it. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of, it functions as quite a nice test bed of uh, an instrument that really does get repeated and, and built a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so we've learned a lot about how to document something to make it easy to reproduce um, mm -hmm. that I think we wouldn't have learned if, there was just a small number of very specialist labs duplicating our stuff. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, next question is for Adri um, uh, Benedict, uh, actually from Adrian again. Uh, it's uh, His question is, is it possible to use a cell phone to reduce the cost? Uh, I'm not sure I myself understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it depends what it's tackling. So um, I think, so what, um, the open fixture microscope, for example, uses is the the standard Raspberry Pi camera, which is I think like as a bulk or like the whole package in the range of some hundred euro or maybe maybe a bit more depends. So in, I think if you um, have a good cell phone, it's most likely a bit more expensive. And since you always need to relay the image with a secondary lens, uh, it's I think a little bit more expensive. Um, so I think so. What we have tested is a bunch of different cameras. So there are these small industry grade cameras, monochrome um, in the range of some 300 euros, which are also doing a good job. Um, but surprisingly, the cameras from cell phones are also quite nice. So in terms of read noise and um, they have a nice, well, sometimes if you can access the raw images, uh, they also have a nice API for, for getting it. Um, and so it really depends um, 
yeah the, the problem maybe is also um well it doesn't answer the question but um compared to richard's approach where you really can nicely calibrate your uh, camera um the problem with you, the different variety of the different cameras is that you cannot really uh tell that one image compares the other so it's, it's a large variety between can camera sensors and firmware versions and um yeah so it's i think having only the Res raspberry pi camera even though it's maybe not the best one um it's nice because it's reproducible <laughs> yeah i why, why don't you use a cell phone instead is a question that i've i've heard a lot and i think largely using a cell phone is cheaper only if you assume that cell phones are free which they're not um uh, if you want to use someone's cell phone for five minutes to demonstrate a cool toy great if you want to tie up someone's cell phone for an hour to scan a sample mm -hmm. like you're not going to be on WhatsApp for an hour. I mean, very few people are prepared to accept that. Um, yeah. And actually a, a consideration for um, some of the applications we have in low resource settings. If you bring in a microscope that has a shiny cell phone bolted to it, I guarantee you that within, within about three hours of me leaving the lab, the shiny cell phone is no longer bolted to the microscope. <laughs> and what I've just delivered is a shiny cell phone for somebody and a useless paperweight. <laughs> Yeah, but that's, that's a really well point. Uh, the point. And also, like I think the point by Benedict uh, is also very valid that I think you want to standardize and I think that for having a fixed type of camera is great. Uh, the second yeah. question for you, uh, Benedict, is is about uh, uh, another practical one, like the yes, Anonymous attendee wants to know uh, whether you sell boxes with the parts for different versions of the microscope. <laughs> that's a very good question. And uh, since we're open, I can also talk openly that we're trying to, to work on that. <laughs> so we have so, um, so as it said, uh, so I'm not in the institute right now, but uh, I have some cubes here. So these are the injection yeah. model cubes, and yeah. um, we produce quite a bunch of them. And we, we really wanted to sell them to uh, other people so that they can make use of it. The problem is that, um, well, publicly funded research institutes, at least in Germany, uh, they really make life uh, very, very difficult if you would like to sell something or make even something available for low cost or cheap or whatsoever. Um, so they, they basically forced us to kind of spin off and so we will well we we need to found a company to uh, work on that and so the the first aim is to really sell these boxes also to somehow uh, make sure that parts are available because the the problem with aliexpress and amazon or whatsoever is also that um, not everybody has access to those well shops and uh, if you have kids and sell them somehow openly then i think that's making science a bit more well accelerated let's say <laughs> yeah yeah uh, the, the follow-up question might be something that uh, richard might have already answered the question is how far is the development of the inverted fluorescence microscope the open fixture microscope um well so there is currently a preprint being worked on that describes the delta stage um, and that's where most of our recent fluorescence work has been done so uh, it exists you can build it it works um, it's not currently very well supported by the software and currently the, the flat field correction is a bit painful to do um, it's also currently the case that you insert and remove the fluorescence filter cube in a slightly awkward manual process so it's quite hard to switch between fluorescence and bright field. Um, so you can you can just turn on the white LED and do bright field through your filter cube. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But um, if you need to actually remove or change the filter cube, that's that's currently a bit fiddly. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd love to have an automated filter switcher. That was one of the reasons for switching fluorescence stuff onto the delta stage. Uh, but we've not got there yet. Uh, mm -hmm. If somebody wants to take that one on, that would be and that would be an awesome project, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Uh, I guess the next question is also maybe you have already answered, but uh, maybe the question was asked during our conversation. It's about what is the resolution of the uh, micro manipulator uh, in, uh, well, I guess maybe that's for uh, Benedict's uh, mi micro manipulator or the one open flexure. Either way, both of you can answer that. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's maybe related to my talk, but I think the question is uh, going to Richard because he's the inventor of the, or uh, yeah, the block stage. So what was it, um, 15 nanometers or? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the block stage is geared down by a factor of, well, you can set the, the gearing, actually, mm-hmm. but um, I think it's geared down by default by a factor of five. Uh, mm-hmm. I actually can't remember exactly off the top of my head. So that would give a nominal step size of 10 nanometers. Um, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to be able to resolve 10 nanometer steps, but um, yeah, you, you should be able to make ball- movements in that ballpark. And certainly when I tested it out, by hand without the motors even, I was quite routinely able to make nice one to 200 nanometer steps. Okay. And I'd expect that to be quite a bit smaller with motors. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's all the question I had from Q&A. Uh, maybe I'll add one more question from both of you. And especially I was thinking mostly in terms of Benedict's uh, sort of use of UC2 for uh, super resolution and virus detection. What is the, like when, when somebody does microscopy, one of the key concern is the health of the sample. And when I was looking at this, my, my question was like, okay, um, this camera is able to detect single molecule and you have a light source. What is the photon budget and how does it compare with respect to single molecule detection in like a really expensive camera uh, and setup where lights are more better transmitted? I, well, that's, I think, a question which is really hard to, to answer um, because I think that goes back to the, the, the problem that you cannot really calibrate your uh, cameras the way that you really know what's the number of photons emitting uh, or like arriving at the, the sensor plane. I think we did some calibration on one of our sensors for getting to know uh, the read noise and the gain, and, um, but we don't have physical units for the photon. Uh, yet, so we are on it, um, but um, it's, I don't know, I don't have a quantitative number, to be honest. So I think you, you, you can image uh, single molecules GFP and then Cherry, um, everything which is um, sci-fi for Alexa 647, like uh, you can clearly see because they're super bright, um, but um, I don't know where the limit is actually. I think the bleaching is more the limit. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, maybe one way that you might be able to uh, sort of uh, find the answer for that is is by comparing lifetimes of the fluorescent proteins. Mm-hmm. For example, because the fluorescent proteins have fixed number of photons or relatively yeah. fixed number of photons. So if you look at trajectory length, because I think the interesting question for live cell microscopy would be uh, like, for example, if I have to image a single virus or a protein in a like a cell, how many photons do I have to bombard the cell with relative to a standard super resolution microscope? Yeah. Because if the number goes up by 100 or so, then you have to start to consider like, okay, how can I reduce this? Mm. Uh, so, yeah. That's a very good uh, good point. So um, so what we did, so um, I don't know what the proper term for uh, in English, um, but so if you go um, fishing, there are like these little lamps which you stick to your um, thing with you. <laughs> I don't know what, I, I, I don't, I, I miss the, the jargon for uh, fishing. Um, okay. But so there is like a fluorescent, Thing, I think which is even radioactive and you it has a uh, fluorescent lifetime decay which uh, you can uh, spec- well you can somehow compute and then you have a photon uh, source which is calibratable or calibrated and if you use that for calibrating for example your cell phone sensor you know what's the photon budget so from there we should also know mm-hmm. how much worth we are compared to a Zeiss microscope for example yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I think that that would help a lot and um, is there sort of, uh, you said something about the uh, the uh, optical trap, uh, optical tweezer work. Could you elaborate a bit more on sort of what you're thinking about or if somebody wants to sort of uh, work with you or sort of think about it together, what, <laughs> what are the things they should think about? <laughs> I, that was just um, well, kind of a fun note because um, I, well, I, I know Richard from my bachelor thesis when I, I used his red tweezers, with, which I think is a, an open source um, lab view plugin which you can use for holographic optical tweezers mm-hmm. and um, I think that was in maybe 2010 or so I don't know or 11 and um, uh, it, it was just fun that like all the way from there to now uh, open source was always the dominating factor in my research and um, I think it would be well I think uh, like spatial light modulators are still kind of expensive there are some low-cost solutions of course but it would be nice if somebody of course uh, works on that to make it open source in terms of hardware because I think the hardware to to assemble it is mostly uh, well not open source yet. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I actually put out a master's project for later this year um, where they have the choice between building an optical tweezer using 
a combination of UC2 and uh, OpenFlexure, or building the um, structured illumination microscope. <laughs> and they, they've picked the structured illumination microscope. So, <laughs> um, I will be uh, finally getting myself a good excuse to reproduce one of Benedict's projects, which will be a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, you, you'll notice actually a, a striking similarity between the red tweezers interface and the OpenFlexure microscope interface. We've kind of converged on the same panel layout, mm -hmm. even though all the all the underlying technology is very different. Um, <laughs> it seems that I like putting panels down the left hand side of the microscope. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was also great to see sort of like when I was hearing both of your talk, it was obvious that the next step is to really bring in these uh, sort of precise stage movements into this flexible world of UC2. And then I think Benedict just posted somebody actually did that. That was great to see that there's already people combining open flexure with UC2. And I think that's fantastic. It's like already getting to the point of scanning microscopes. Um, yeah. I think that's uh, that's all the questions we had. Um, is there anything else, Stephanie? or? Um, no, make? no, that's um, great. So um, I think we're we've just gone over the hour anyway. So I think it's a great time to wrap up. Um, just to say, uh, I guess one last thank you to everyone for for joining, and a massive thank you to our speakers. It was really interesting discussion and really interesting presentations. So thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you to our speakers. Yeah, thanks both. Yeah, thank you thanks. very much. Thank you. Yeah.